was an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Buffalo, New York. It is the 16th of May, 2007, approximately 4 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name? Howard Edward Amy Jr. Okay. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born <coughs> in Detroit, Michigan on July the 1st, 1921. Okay. What was your educational background prior to going into service? I didn't even make it out of high school. They took me out of high school and took me into the service. I wasn't drafted, but I was already in the service and they federalized the National Guard mm -hmm. and they shipped us all down to Fort McClellan, Alabama. Okay. When, when did you join the National Guard? In 1938. Why did you ju decide to join the National Guard? Mm -hmm. Something to do, I suppose. How old were you when you joined? Well, let's see, in 38 I was uh, 17. Mm -hmm. Your parents signed for you? Yeah. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, now, what did you, where did you, what armory were you in? in uh, 106 field artillery over on Maston Avenue. Okay. I still am. I'm still a member over there. Really? Yeah. I got my, my card and everything. I've been a member over there ever since, well, since I joined the Army and began with. What kind of money did you get back then? Well, it started out with $21, and then after 30 days, I got $30. Uh-huh. Uh, well, well, he'll take that. You want to focus on yep. that? Okay, got it. <clears throat> now, uh, how often did you go over there uh, once a month we had drills over the armory, mm -hmm. and then uh, once in a, well, twice a year they would uh, take us uh, for a week, and we'd go to Pine Camp, up the northern part of the state. Right. And uh, one time we went to I can't think of the name of the town. It was a small town way up in the northern. New York State on the state line and they had troops from all over New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Massachusetts all assembled there to be reviewed by President Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. We stood out there in that hot sun for hours and all of a sudden Attention and everybody for as miles as you, far as you can see come to attention. And if I'd have blinked, I wouldn't have seen the car it was going so fast. <laughs> <laughs> now, with the field artillery at that time, were you using horses? No, we, uh, we had half tracks. They were all motorized. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of guns did you have? 155 horses and little 37 millimeters that they fastened on the barrel in case you needed a smaller gun. Mm -hmm. Now were these left over from World War I? Uh, I would assume they were. Mm -hmm. Before we went, were shipped down to Fort McClellan, Alabama, they took those away and gave us all the new ones. Mm -hmm. You must have still been wearing the World War I helmets? Yeah, they were, but, well we used to wash them, that's how they curled up on the side. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you used the, M, the 1903 Springfield? No, when, we, when, I was in the, when we first got in, every cannoneer in the field artillery carried a 45. Oh, you carried 45s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then when they shipped us down to Alabama and they federalized all the National Guards and everything, they needed all the 45s for the officers, then they gave us a carbine. It's a nice little weapon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when did you go to Alabama? Uh, that was in either the end of 39 or 40. Mm -hmm. then, oh, that's when you were federalized? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it like down in Alabama? How were you treated uh, being a northerner? Hot and wet. <laughs> A lot of rain, and we were at, uh, just outside of Hanniston, Alabama, and it was all surrounded by mountains. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it wasn't that bad. We, we spent about a year and a half down there. How did the Southerners treat you? Oh, they treated us great. They would come out and take carloads of us into town for dinners and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We did go to a store and do some shopping. A lot of times you only had to pay half price, sometimes a smaller item, they'd give them to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were treated great by the people down there. Mm -hmm. Now, were you down there when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, uh, well, I was in the service then. Yeah, yes, in right. fact, we were supposed to come home for Christmas that year. We had the sleeping cars and everything on the siding to bring us home for Christmas. And the war started on December the 7th, mm -hmm. and we were supposed to leave about two days later to come home for a 30-day furlough. Instead, they loaded all of our trucks and guns and everything on flat cars and off to California we went. Now, how did, how did you hear about Pearl Harbor? Do you remember? Yeah, probably by the radio. Mm -hmm. well, did anyone, how did the guys around you react? How did you react when you heard about it? We were mad because it <clears throat> cut into our... 30 day furlough. <laughs> <laughs> now when you went by rail to California, um, what did you do out there? Well, for the first 30 days we were living in tents. They pulled the train off on a siding and some farmer's field he turned it over to us and we set up all our camp there. And then after that then they uh, shipped us down to uh, Fort Ord, California. We stayed there for, well, until April of 42, yeah. And then we went shipped overseas to Hawaii. Now, what you, what were you assigned to? What unit were you assigned to then? You were still with the 106? Oh, yeah. yeah I was in the 106 all the way, all the way through. Um, except for one time. Mm -hmm. I was uh, put on special assignment to go. To, uh, I, the Navy needed a shore fire control team. They would land with the first two waves of infantry and we would direct Navy fire onto the island until they secured enough of it to bring the guns in. That otherwise, all the time, I've been, I've been in the 106 field artillery for a long time. What division were you assigned to? Uh, the 27th division. Oh, okay. All right. Um, when you went out to, to uh, Hawaii, what did you do? How long were you there? Well, we went to the Big Island of Hawaii, mm -hmm. and we spent uh, a year there building gun emplacements because they were in sad shape. When they got attacked by the Japanese, they were just lucky that the Japs didn't decide to come back and take those islands because they didn't have they had 16-inch long rifles, but those things were fixed. Mm -hmm. They could disappear into the side of the hill and come back out and shift back and forth. But they had nothing, so we had all our 155 howitzers, so we went right around the whole island and built up gun emplacements. And like I say, it took us about a year to do that. And then they sent in reinforcements from the states, and they took over the positions we had, and then they shipped us over to Oahu. It's nice over there. Mm -hmm. What were your duties there? Uh, we manned gun emplacements and stuff like that. that mm -hmm. um, had a lot of pastime. What did you do in your spare time? Went into Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, well, there's some things to do. Mostly, most of the things I did was take pictures. Mm -hmm. I got bushels of pictures that I've taken of all this whole deal. Mm -hmm. In fact, I brought some. Oh. I'd like to see them. Sure. Now, what what kind of camera did you have? Oh, I had a I had a little box camera, and if you remember the. Oh, I had a ref what they called a reflex camera. Mm -hmm. You open up the top and you yep. look down through the top, and it, you put the film in the bottom, mm -hmm. and it had a lever on the back. Then once you put it in there, you threw the lever. 
that whoever invented it put the lever in the wrong spot. Because we're on, our, on the train going out to California and I had volunteered to work in the, the kitchen serving the food because I had a cot there to sleep on. Yeah. And I would stand in the doors, they had the big sliding doors open, I'd stand in the door to the chain across there and I'd be bouncing around with this, the moose motion of the train. All of a sudden, the motion just hit one too many times. <laughs> Sliding back and forth across my chest, flipped that switch on the back of the camera, and all of the cuts and the film and everything dropped out of the camera, and there it was along the trip. I took the rest off and threw it away. <laughs> and then I got out to California that night wrote a letter and told my folks that I didn't have a camera anymore, so they sent me a nice reflex camera. Now, how did you obtain film during the whole war? Well, you go into town, you could get film pretty mm -hmm. good, yeah. Especially in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Now, where was this one taken? Uh, this is in uh, Fort Ord, California. We didn't just stay in barracks, we lived mm -hmm. in Tents all over. Those big the tents? Yeah, we never did get into Can any you, barracks. Just hold it up. You, there, that's perfect. The title of this is Me and My Radio. <laughs> yeah, Me and My Radio. I got okay. that radio for 50% oh, off. I think it cost me $6. Now, is this a gunman emplacement in Hawaii? Well, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> this was, uh, it wasn't our outfit, it was one of the outfits on Hawaii, yeah. Are you in this one, or is this just another unit you no, took? it's a unit that we have to go and visit these guys. Now, are those some of the emplacements you helped construct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, got it. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, how long were you on Hawaii, in Hawaii? <coughs> uh, well, we was on the Big Island for a year, mm -hmm. and then we moved over to Oahu, and we were there. I was there for a little over six months. But from there, uh, Oahu was our uh, main base. And we went from there to Saipan and Tinian mm -hmm. and took that operation. And then we came back to Hawaii. And then while they were refitting us and everything, they needed specialist, radio specialist. And I had gone to radio school, but that's when they put me on a special assignment to go to Kwajalein and, and Awitak Atolls. Mm -hmm. So I went on that, and then we came, from there we didn't come back to Hawaii, we went to an island just off of Australia, and we stayed there, oh, I'd say maybe three or four months, and then from there we went to Okinawa, and that's where I got shipped home from after I got wounded. Now, now, could you tell us about Saipan? They needed, they needed Saipan and Tinian mm -hmm. because that's where the bombers took the atomic bombs to Japan from. Mm -hmm. They had to have some place in between. Otherwise, they would have, if they'd have sent them from anything farther away, the planes would have to have gone farther and ended up in China. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want that. They wanted to get them back to where they came from. So that's why they took Saipan and Tinian. So well, they, were, uh, did you go ashore and fight on Saipan? Oh, yeah, yeah. Could you tell us about that? Well, like I said, I was a radio operator, a switchboard operator, so I didn't do much. I sit there with my radio waiting for somebody to talk to. But, uh, were you there for the bonsai attack? On Saipan? Uh, <clears throat> tell you the truth, I don't know. All I know is that I landed with the second wave of infantry because of being an operator, radio operator, I had to land and communicate back to the ship. Now what, what did you do? Was this when you were involved with the Navy? Uh, <laughs> Were you calling right in fire after, support? Right after. Mm -hmm. I had done what I was supposed to do with them with, and done uh, 
Quadzin and, and a Weetok, they needed somebody on shore because of these atolls, there's, all they are is a bunch of islands. Mm -hmm. And they're so low that even on board the ships they couldn't see what was going on on the islands because you got over the horizon. Mm -hmm. You just barely see the island. So that's what our job was to go there and radio back all the information we could find, and let them know where the targets were and stuff like that. So you were calling in fire support at Kwajalein and we yeah. Talk. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you were separated from the 27th Division then during that short time. Yeah, I, I don't have anything about that in my record. Mm -hmm. I figure, I imagine that's the reason for it, because they were probably separated from the, my regular unit, but I would assume that somebody would send them back things that happened while I was there. I never did find out. Of course, I go to the armory just about every year for the reunion. We've had a reunion over at the Maston Avenue Armory every year for 60 some years. Mm -hmm. That's a great bunch of guys. Now, how long were you on Kwajalein and then we talk? Uh, not very long. We were, we were on board ship, but we didn't stay on the island very long because, mm -hmm. like I said, they were small mm -hmm. and there was nothing to do and anything, so they put us out on the ship and we maybe sat in the harbor for a couple of months. And then after that, then they sent us down to this island off of Australia for rest and recuperation. And then after that, then we went to Okinawa. Could you talk about Okinawa? What happened there? Well, I dodged the bullets for the whole oh, five years and 11 months I was in the service, and I ended up getting sh getting a piece of shrapnel in Okinawa, and that sent me home. Whereabouts were you hit? In my side in the back here. We were riding along in a Jeep, and I saw somebody up ahead around the bushes and there was an old truck that had been damaged and everything and I, I said, this, this didn't look right to me. There shouldn't be anybody around that area. So I told the driver, I said, you better take this off to the left. So we started to take it off to the left and whoever was in there must have known that we were planning on pulling away. And he threw a grenade and the grenade, if if we'd have gone straight, I probably would have got it right here. Mm -hmm. But by the fact that I'm facing this way and my back is almost to him, that's where I got the shrapnel. Mm -hmm. Just a lucky move. Mm -hmm. How badly were you wounded? Oh, I was only laid up for about four days. Because mm -hmm. they don't let you lay around if they, as long as you can get up and eat, they'll let you up. Oh, um, did you have to go to an aid station? Yeah, they, well, they took care of me right there. They removed the, the shrapnel, and they, every day I had to go to the doctor at the aid station. But then after that, after two days, then they had to take me about 15 miles down to the beach where they had you know, the doctors were and everything, and I had to get a tetanus shot and all that. But then I was all set. But like that, that five points really paid off. <laughs> now did you, how long did you stay in Okinawa then, after that? Well, I think maybe about two, three months. Mm -hmm. But they kept saying, well, Howard, you're going to be going home now. I said, why? He said, well, we added up your points and compared them with everybody else in the outfit and said because of that, that piece of shrapnel that's giving you five points, it's going to get you out of here. And there was one other fellow in one of the other outfits that had the points of the two of us came home at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you do on Okinawa with your battery? Well, I was a radio operator, so mm -hmm. that's right sent messages and I also a telephone operator and they never done and they need extra help I string telephone lines and they keep busy anything you keep busy mm -hmm. when did you finally leave Okinawa 
Uh, well, I got home in October, so it must have been, I think I got home on October the 10th. So we must have left Okinawa by sometime in September. So you were discharged? I was discharged in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Figure that one out. <laughs> if I'd have lived east of Rochester, they would have flown me across from there to Fort Dix, and I'd have been discharged from over there. Mm -hmm. But because I lived west of Rochester, I had to take that stupid train all the way across the country. And then I had to spend three days in Camp Atterbury, Indiana, while they processed all my papers. The Army is great for passing out clothes. When I landed in San Francisco, took all my clothes, all brand new clothes, everything, shoes, socks, everything. Got on the train, come to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Mind you now, I'm wearing all my new clothes. Got in Camp Atterbury, Indiana, took away all my clothes and gave me all brand new clothes. I said, well, boy, okay, but I said, the only problem is you didn't give me an Eisenhower jacket. I had the well, a blouse like they mm -hmm. got in that picture mm -hmm. there. Well, it was five years and 11 months I'll never forget. I don't know how you got your bayonet. Hmm? The bayonet you found. That knife. The you found the bayonet? Oh, yeah, I gave it to him. Yeah, a Japanese bayonet. How'd you get that? Well, if I did, yeah. I was out on observation out forward, picking out targets for the guys to shoot at. And I walked around this hill, and there was like a little cave. And I walked inside, and there's a, a woman dead. Uh, well, I'm not going to go any farther into this place, so I came out and went just around the bend a little more, and here's this guy laying out there outside, and he's, I didn't know what he had. He's wearing very little clothes because of the hot temperature and everything. So I rolled him over to see what, you know, what he looked like and everything. And when I rolled him over, there was this brand new, bayonet laying right there on the ground under him. So I picked it up and brought it home. And then I put this stupid thing up in the attic in my house and over the years it got rusty. There was a brand new one. Everything was perfect. Are there any other stories you remember that you want to mention? My memory's not that good anymore. Uh, you've been very good so far. Did you see any uh, entertainers or any USO oh, shows? Oh, yes, yes. I've seen Bob Hope and, and uh, oh, what the heck was her name? I can't think of the names of them now either. But they, you know, they had USO shows quite mm -hmm. often over there. Of course, not where the, in the areas where we were in the battle zones or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But when we go to rest areas and stuff like that, we always had entertainment. And it was good entertainment too. Mm -hmm. These people, they, they treated you as if you were a family. How about going over to Hawaii? You told me that story about the, the troop ship going over. Oh, the HMS Warden? Yeah. Oh, that was a <clears throat> HMS Warden. It was a British cruise ship, it would hold 1,500 passengers in compartments, in mm -hmm. staterooms. They had 500 of us on board ship. We had the whole ship. And we would go down to the staterooms and pick up the mattresses off the cots, and bring them up, and stack them up three and four high on the promenade deck. And that's how we went overseas, sleeping up on deck on those mattresses. Everybody said, and you were going to war? I said, yeah. <laughs> Is there any, 
I was just saying, how about the guys on the ship with you? You said how they a lot of them got sick. Oh, I volunteered to work in the kitchen. When they'd serve a meal, be in a British ship. They would bring the food in like big dish pans, and you'd help yourself. But you've got this action, and anything if it's anything that's juicy in those pans, it's going swoosh, swoosh. <laughs> By the time they get all the food on the table, everybody's up over the rail. <laughs> Me, I volunteered to work serving the food. So I didn't even look at that food, because I knew what the last item was they were going to give, and that was fresh fruit. Apples, oranges, bananas, plums, all kinds of stuff. It's the last item you got. I took the whole trip to Hawaii, ate nothing but fruit, and I'm one of those that walked off the ship. The rest of them had, they were quarantined on board the ship until they all got well enough to get off. That was great. Were there any uh, close friends that you made while you were in service? Well, I went with the whole unit from Buffalo, so we had over, over 500 people that went with us on that, mm -hmm. out of the 106. And then I did meet a couple of Australian sailor, er, soldiers. I, I didn't have their names or addresses, so I couldn't keep in touch with them afterwards. But we always seemed to click, we'd get together, and I loved their accent. Oh, man. In fact, after I come out of the service and I went to New York City. And while I was in New York City, I took the boat ride around the island and out to the Statue of Liberty. And I'm up on the front of the ship and this family's up there and they're talking. And I said, they talk kind of funny. And I would had a little girl, maybe about seven or eight years old, and I said, by any chance, are you people from Australia? And she said, yes, so I'm from Australia. And we had that accent. And we got talking there and had a great time for all the while we were riding around her. I had an apple, I gave her the apple. I met, I met quite a few people, but not for any length of time that you could do much about it. Here's some more photographs that I, I just picked out some of them. Yeah. Um, if you hold them up like this, he can focus on them. Where? When was that one taken? Oh, this is down in Fort You notice the helmet? Yes. That, that's. Yeah, this is taken down in Fort McCollum, Alabama. And the ones with the horses. And yes, that's right. The horse and the, air, the one with the airplanes in. I didn't see that one. Well, they're in, the, in there someplace. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, they're. Uh, I got that one. Okay. They were taken in. Uh, with the horse and the airplanes was taken on maneuvers when we went to Arkansas and Louisiana before we went over. So the, the, you took cavalry? Yeah, yeah. I, I can hold this and you can oh, hold okay. So yeah, this. Okay. There was, there was <clears throat> I was amazed that there was that many cavalry that took part in that maneuvers that time. So this was around 1940 then, 41? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that was in Arkansas and Louisiana. Okay, got it. So this is one of your guns? Yep, it's a whole field full of them. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> okay, got it. Now you told them with uh, the trucks, is that what? Were they towed by the trucks that you have in the picture? Yeah, yeah. yeah because they, these are the new guns, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they took away the old guns, they had the old half-tracks. They were noisy. They were hard to operate because you did the steering with the levers and everything. So it was the best thing they ever did was to get rid of those things and give us trucks. Mm -hmm. Now, is that you? No, that's my buddy that lived over off of Amherst Street in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Now, are you in this picture then? You're probably taking all the pictures and didn't 
Get in that well, one. <laughs> well, uh, the first one I got, I don't know how I got into that one. Somebody went, I can't see half the time. No, I just, I must have been taken away. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, well, <clears throat> after you got out of the service, did you ever use the GI Bill? I bought my house. Do you use a 5220 club at all? What was that? It was like an unemployment, $20 a month for 52... $20, $20 a, week. a week. for 52 weeks. Didn't even know it existed. Oh boy, you missed out on something. Well, yeah. I got a job. You started to work right away yeah, after I, you got out? Yeah, I got out and got a job working for Lindy Air. Mm -hmm. that, one, that ran out after a while. And then I... When they laid me off, I looked for another job, and I got a job working for Morrison Steel Products. It was on the Ammo Street in mm -hmm. Buffalo. I put in 40 years. Wow. We were retired from there, so I didn't do too bad. No. Um, did you join, join any veterans organizations? <clears throat> I, I still belong to the 106 Field Artillery Veterans Association mm -hmm. of the Mass and Navajo Army. Mm -hmm. And I never joined the American Legion or the VFW either one. I told myself, I said, when I get out of this thing, I'm not even going to join the Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> you had two girls sitting at the window. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, how do you think your time in the service had changed your life or affected it? In well, some way? It limits what you do. Mm -hmm. That's just about all. I didn't dislike it. You grew up in the service. I, I, that's what I say. I, I didn't dislike it because I chose it myself. Mm -hmm. And I could put all those years in crying out loud. How can you dislike something if you're going to stick with it? Now what are those? Oh, these are the awards that I got. Recently. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the conspicuous service. service. And there's what came with it. Okay, got it. All right, got uh, it. You received the Purple Heart. Do you have any other medals that you received? Oh, I got about, what, eight or nine of them. They're all listed on the uh, discharge papers. The discharge, uh, yeah. yeah, the discharge. I got the discharge papers there. They're all listed on that. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The American Defense Service, the Good Conduct, Purple Heart. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, I'm, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> when you were, when you went off, remember you were on that, that ship and you got sent off to that uh, advanced area as a radio operator? Yeah. And you said the guy came off and he threw that, that load of explosives and it threw you backwards? Yeah. Remember that? You explained that to him. That was pretty interesting. Remember that? Oh, we had just landed on the beach. Where? I had my, this is in, uh, one of the atolls, you know, or Quadrant or in the Ouija, one of the other, anyhow. We had just landed on the beach and they had a gun emplacement right up the sand, like a dune up there. Mm -hmm. And this was all it was sand. And from when it come off of the water, it looked like just a hill of sand. So I set up my radio in front of it, and I'm getting ready to contact the ship to let them know where I was at and what was going on. And one of the infantry guys comes along, he's got, you know, you know what a pack charge is? Yes. It's about the size of these port army telephones, portable mm -hmm. telephones. Holds the pin, threw it into the opening into where these Japanese were. On this, and it was all right. He got the Japanese. That was the main object. 
fighter with such a powerful charge, it blew the whole front end right out on me. Oh. I was buried in sand, my <clears throat> radio was shot, everything. So there I am, sitting on the beach, no equipment, nothing to do anything with. So one of the officers come along and he says, he says, hey, are you lost, fella? I said, I not only lost, I said, I lost all of my equipment. He says, well, go back down to the beach, they'll put you back on the ship. So they put me back on the ship and every night when all these guys are on the island, they're ducking and everything else, I'm sitting on the ship watching movies on deck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great.